Welcome back to the Survival Guide uh, in Mathematics for Economists. Uh, I'm Adam Jacobson, your le uh, lecturer. Uh, today we will discuss concavity and convexity. And why is that important? Well, if we are to use equations and different types of functions, which we do all the time, then it is really, really useful to be able to characterize these functions in terms of concavity or convexity. For example, a monopolist wants to maximize profits, and the monopolist has a profit function, and uh, if he or she wants to find the profit maximum point of production, then it is really useful to know is the profit function, is it concave or is it convex? So we will get back to that. Let us start with looking at concavity. Now I have drawn here on the x-axis you have uh, the exogenous variable x uh, and on the y-axis we have the value of the function. And I have drawn a random uh, function here starting at 0, 0 and going up like this. And most of you will intuitively see, okay, this is a concave function. Why is it a concave function? Well, intuitively, it means that you see the slope here is really steep here. And when you proceed and evaluate the slope at different values of x, you see that the slope here is quite steep, not, not as quite steep here, and here is not very steep, here it's zero, and then it turns negative. So you can see that the slope is continuously decreasing, right? And that is one way of thinking about a concave function is that the slope keeps on getting less and less positive, this less and less steep function. There are, of course, more formal ways of defining what is a concave function. And we will also see what is a strictly concave function. Incidentally, this is a strictly concave function because there are no flat parts on this curve here. Let us now see how we more formally can show that this is a concave function. Uh, one way of checking this is to pick two points on an interval here. Let's say this is the interval of x we are interested in, positive x's. And in economics it's quite common that we are only interested in positive values of the independent variable. For example, if this was the level of production and this is profits, then it doesn't really make sense to evaluate at a negative uh, level of production. What is a negative level of production? So usually we're interested in the positive quadrant here. So anyway, let's pick two points, two random points, A and B in the interval here. So pick two values of X. And then we can see what is the value of the function evaluated at point X when X is equal to A. Well, it's F of A. And over here we can see the value of the function when we're looking at when x is b is indeed f of b. And then so hence we pick two random points on this line. And then let us draw a line connecting this point and that point. And we can see that the entirety, the whole line is below the graph is below the function, the line here. And if that is the case, then we have a concave function. In fact, uh, we can see that uh, if we pick any, two, any point on this line, it will be below or on this, this function here. Because if we pick the point A, we're going to be exactly on the graph, right? Have the same value here. Or if we point, pick point B, we're going to be on the uh, line, the function line here. But if we put, pick any point, an interior point that is to the right of A and up to the left of B, we are somewhere here, then we see we are clearly below this line here. So that means that we have a concave function. If this line here is always below or on the line, it's, it is a concave function. Let's do this a bit more formally. So we define, let's pick this point between A and B here. So we call it X uh, upper bar. And let's define it as the following. So X upper bar is equal to lambda A plus one minus lambda 
B, where lambda, this here, because this is a weighted average of A and B, right? We are picking a point somewhere between A and B. So, so the value of lambda is between 0 and 1. Sorry. Okay, so if lambda is 1, then we can see x upper bar is 1 times a, it's a plus 1 minus 1, 0. So if lambda is 1, we're going to be on a, exactly here, there. And if lambda is 0, then we are over there. Now let's look at one example where we set lambda equal to 1 half. That implies that x upper bar is equal to 0.5a plus 0.5b, and that is of course equal to a plus b uh, divided by 2. So uh, I, I have in fact drawn that here, because this x upper bar is exactly in between a and b, it's in the middle here. So. That's one example of a lambda. So let's say that this is x upper bar. Now let's go to look at the mathematical definition of a concave function. Okay, a function defined on an interval i is now again, what is the interval i? Well, that means that the function defined on interval i, that means that we should think about, okay, for what values of x are we looking at? Now, the interval in this case could be between 0 and over here. So the, the whole interval we are looking at is this here, right? We could have looked at negative numbers as well, increase the interval to going back here, but since we are economists, we usually don't we are usually not so interested in negative, for example, levels of production and so, and so on. So the interval just means where do we evaluate the function here? And we do it, and we, we define that over what range of x we are looking at, positive x's. Okay? But it could be negative as well, because in, in, in using uh, the general definition. But usually in economics we're looking at positive values of x, if it is level of production, for example. Okay, uh, so this uh, function is then defined as concave, concave, if for all a and b in the interval i, Okay, so we're picking any a and any b in this interval here, okay? And for all lambdas, values of lambda, in the closed interval between 0 and 1. Okay, so first you pick two points on this line, a and b. And then you set the lambda, and we saw that the lambda could be any number between 0 and 1. That means that, okay, are we going this way for a very big lambda or that way for a small lambda? <clears throat> okay, if this is the case, 1 has that we have a concave function, and this is true, then 1 has the following f of lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b, that is the value of the function evaluated at this x upper bar, because this is, this is x upper bar. So the first thing we drew here was, okay, what is the value of the function evaluated at x upper bar? So then we have to go up
So we see here x upper bar was the value of the function, well, it's up here. So that is f of x upper bar. Okay. So if we have a concave function, then the value of this is greater than or bigger than the following lambda times f of a plus lambda times f of b. And going up and looking at that is basically, okay, that is the height of the line evaluated at x upper bar. And we see that the line that we have on the right hand side, the height of the line here is below the value of the function evaluated at this x upper bar. So it's basically this height here. This is lambda times f of a plus 1 minus lambda times f of b. So we can see that this is clearly lower. This point here is below this point here. Okay, so that's, uh, this is the condition for concavity. We see that it's this value here is bigger or equal to. Now, <clears throat> then, if uh, the same value of uh, that we had up here, f of lambda a plus 1 minus lambda times b is strictly greater than the same function here, lambda times f of a plus 1 minus lambda times f of b. Sorry, my poor handwriting skills. So if, if it is strictly greater than, if it's always below, if this is always higher, uh, when A is not the same number as B, meaning that, okay, we have picked an A at another point than B. There's a distance between A and B, right? And we choose the lambda in the open interval between 0 and 1. Meaning that, okay, let's say we picked A and B, and before when we're looking at concavity, we okay, then it was okay to pick, you know, this point if la lambda is 1. But now we are moving into the interior in this interval here, so that means that, okay, we are all, we are somewhere between A and B, not quite at A and not quite at B, but somewhere in between. Lambda is in the open interval, not 0, not 1, somewhere in between. And then f of x is strictly concave. Now looking at the function I just drew here, is it true that this function as I drawn it here, if we pick any two points a and b, and we draw a line between a and b, and we can see that if we go in just a little bit on this line connecting A and B, we see that it's always below, strictly below. It's not on the line, it's always below here. So this function here is in fact strictly concave because this line here is always strictly below the, the, the function itself, this function here, when we're looking at the open interval between A and B. We will come back and look at a function that is, is, is concave, but this is strictly concave. That is, the slope is always, 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 at all points of x, decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. Right, so that was uh, concavity. And examples of that, in economics, uh, you can, for example, think of utility functions. You know, if this is my, this is my utility here, and x is my consumption of apples, then you know the first apple gives me, wow, what a boost in utility. Next apple, yeah, it gives me a boost, not as much. The third apple, yeah, it could increase my utility even more, 
and you have a decreasing margin return or margin utility of eating apples. That's a typically concave function, right? So th those types of functions are typically concave. Can we think of convex uh, functions? Yes, we can, but first let's look at, at what is a convex function. Now I have drawn a convex function here, and I have drawn basically the same type of diagram with x on the x-axis and the value of the function itself on the y-axis. And you can see that the black, function, uh, black line here, that is the function itself, and we can see that the slope here is increasing, increasing, increasing. So that's the first intuition. Okay, a convex function, the slope keeps on increasing. And as with the concave case, we have, I have picked two points here in this interval of x. I picked two random points, a and b on the x-axis. And then I looked, uh, then I drew a line between the value of the function evaluated a, which is f of a here, and the value of the function evaluated point b, this is the value of the function evaluated point b, this point here and that point here, and I drew a line between these two points. And here we can see that this line is always above the function here, right, the, the line of the function. As in the concave case, this line was always below this function, but here in the convex case is always above. So as before, we picked a value of x upper bar, and remember that x upper bar is the following, x upper bar is equal to lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b. So it's somewhere in between here. And I picked as before, where lambda is 0 0.5, so this is the midpoint between a and b. And then we see that, okay, what is the value of the function evaluated at x upper bar? We go up here, and then this is the, this is the function's line, so we evaluate here, and this is f of x upper bar. And then we, are, we look at what is the height of the line that we drew between a and b evaluated at x upper bar. What is it is going to be lambda times f of a plus 1 minus lambda times f of b. It's here. So it's this height here. And we see this is bigger now than this value. Uh, so more formally, uh, a convex function has the following properties. So that means that f of x upper bar is smaller or equal to uh, lambda times f of a plus 1 minus lambda times f of b, which is the distance between this point and that point. And the, a convex function then, this, this line, basically it says that, okay, this line is always above or on this curve, right? Always on, always above or on, hence the smaller or equal to sign. And for a strictly convex function, the following is true, that f of x upper bar is strictly smaller than lambda f of a plus 1 minus lambda times f of b. And of course, under the condition that the lambda is in the open interval between 0 and 1, that is, we are slightly to the right of a and slightly to the left of b, you are looking at the interior of this line, and also a cannot be equal to b, so we're looking at the interior again, okay? And we can see here in this case, is this function strictly convex? Yes, it is, because we see that the blue line here is always above the black line. Uh, so that means that this is a strictly convex function. Okay, so that was the mathematical um, definition of what a concave function is, a strictly concave function, and a, a convex or a strictly convex function. So, so let's, me, let's look at one more example.
So again, we have f of x here, and we have x here. And now let's look at this function here. So it's kind of like a bow here. Whoops, you see? And then there's a straight segment here. And it keeps on being convex there. So what is this then? Is this concave, convex? Well, we can see the, the slope is keeps on increasing, increasing. So yeah, it's, it's convex. Is it strictly convex or is it just convex? Well, we can pick any two points here. And is it for strict, strict convexity, then we can pick any two points. And then it must be true that between these two, if we draw a line between those two points, then this line should always be above the function line here. And then we have strict convexity. So let's try. So let's pick this point and this point, and then we draw a line and, well, excuse my poor drawing skills, but yes, this line, the interior of this line is always above. So in this interval between point A and point B, in this interval of X, this function is strictly convex. But let's look at two other points. C and D. I have tried to draw a straight line here. So if we draw another straight line between C and D, we will see that it is exactly on top of the function. That means that, okay, this interior of this line here between points C and D, well, it is not above the function line, it is on the functional line. So it's a convex function because when we pick different points here, um, then we see that, okay, sometimes it's such, it is so that uh, we are sometimes on the line and sometimes above it. So that means that this is a convex function. And again, it depends on which intervals of this function we are looking at. In an interval between A and B, well, then it was strictly convex. But in this interval here, it was just convex. Some of you are probably aware of that there is an even there is a very simple way of evaluating if a function is convex, concave, and, and strictly convex or strictly concave using um, mathematics and using the derivative. So how check for concavity or convexity? Well, uh, one easy thing to do is to take the second derivative of the function. So if f bis, that means the second derivative of some function, if that is smaller or equal to zero uh, on an interval i, then we know that this is a, then f of x is indeed, what is it? It's concave. Okay, let's back up a bit here. What is the second derivative? How should we think about that? You know what the first derivative is? That is the slope of the function, right? So in this case, if, uh, if we have a concave function, let's say it's, so it begins kind of steep and then it's less steep and less steep and less steep. And the second derivative tells us what is the rate of change of the rate of change? Well, if the rate of change, which is the slope of the function, keeps on decreasing, that means that the rate of change of the rate of change is negative. Okay? So the, the, the slope becomes smaller and smaller. So that is the intuitive <laughs> explanation of why it is important to know the second derivative. If the second derivative is smaller or equal to zero, then f of x is concave. And we know if the second derivative is equal to zero, that means that the slope isn't changing. That's a straight line, right? Like I showed you in the previous graph. So or then, so that's why we have concavity. And uh, on the other hand, if f of x is strictly greater than zero, sorry, strictly smaller than zero at some interval of x, that means that f of x is strictly concave. Okay, so that means, again, if you take two points and draw a line, it will, this, uh, 
this line will always be below the functional graph, right? The functions graph. And you may see here that here is a, a double arrow. This is a sufficient a necessary condition. If f, x, f of x is concave, then it must also be that the second derivative is smaller than the gradient smaller than or equal to zero. But here we have only one implication arrow. That means, that means that if the second derivative is smaller, strictly smaller than zero, that implies that the function is strictly concave. Why isn't there an arrow going back here as well? But that's because even though we have a strictly concave function, that we can find cases where the second derivative of uh, the function with respect to x can actually be zero. I will come back to that. Uh, but for now, uh, it's enough to know that if, it, if the second derivative is strict, uh, strictly smaller than zero, then we have a strictly concave function. And of course, when, it, when we're thinking about convexity, then we know that the second derivative of the function with respect to x is of course greater than or equal to zero. And that's a necessary condition for f of x to be convex, and also if the second derivative of the function with respect to x is strictly greater than zero, then uh, again an implication error. That means that f of x is strictly convex. Right. And again, the same logic applies here. We can actually find a strictly convex function that for some x has a, a second derivative equal to zero. I will show you in an example in a minute. Okay, so these are really useful rules and most of you know them since before. So let's look at uh, one example. So let's say we have a function that is f of x is equal to 3 times x to the power of 3. Now, is this a concave, convex, strictly convex, strictly concave function? Well, let's find out. So we start by taking the first derivative of this with respect to x. Then we can use the power rule. So it's 3 times 3 to the power, uh, times x to the power of 3 minus 1, that is 9x squared. Okay, so the first derivative seems to be positive, so, so it seems to be increasing and increasing. And uh, we can sort of guess here that we'll see that as we increase the value of x, this increases. So the slope should increase as we increase the value of x. So, hmm, it's probably quite convex. But let's find out. f double prime of x, that means that we take the derivative of the first derivative, and again we use the power rule, so 2 times 9 times x to the power 2 minus 1 is equal to 18x. And is this greater than 0? Yes. So yes, it is convex, strictly convex. But if we evaluate this function at, at uh, uh, x equals 0, so if I would draw this function, if you would draw it, let's plug it into a computer and you will see a very nice sort of, you know, very strictly convex function. But if you evaluate this number here, the value of the second derivative for x equal 0, then we have f bis of x, that's 18 times 0, is 0. So now you see that even though we know that this is a strictly convex function, we could actually find a point on this function where evaluated it, it as x equal to 0, then we see that the, the second derivative has a value of 0, and hence not strictly positive. So that is why this arrow goes in this direction only and not the other direction. Okay, because we know the function is strictly convex, but still we could find 
and uh, uh, we could find a second uh, a value of the second derivative where it was equal to zero. Okay, that is it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you.